say um, a lot is that um, me and the book are, are two resources for you to use to learn. And um, I don't think it does anyone good if I cover exactly what's in the book. I think the best learning experience is where you know, there's some common ground where we're talking about the same thing. It wouldn't really do you any good if I was talking about, you know, I don't know, geometry, and the book was talking about web page development, right? But by the same token, if I was just reading through the book, that would be really boring. I, the absolute worst teacher I've ever had uh, did that. Open up your books to page 63. You know, it was like it was torture being in that class. Um, with that in mind, uh, there's a few chapters that I'm not formally going to lecture on. We've fallen a little behind. Um, that's okay. Um, there's a handful of chapters, though, that, that I will not formally be lecturing on, or at least not too much. But that doesn't mean you can't bring your questions to class. Um, I posted to Angel what those are. Let me bring that up real quick so we can look at it. We're not even running IE8 in here. We're running IE7. All right. The three chapters, or maybe it's four chapters, that we're not covering are... Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and twenty. And I'm not sure what happened to my recording. Um, I'm going to call them real quick to tell them that something screwy. Oh, hi, this is Mike. Something screwy is going on with my recording. My counsel says, is this a distance learning class? Okay. But, how, I mean, how do I switch between things? Okay. Gotcha. All right. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, I don't, I, I, I can't recall the exact order. Um, of these things, but um, one of them is about web fonts that you can you can read through uh, on your own and enhance it. You know, some of these chapters I don't really feel like I can add a lot to, so you might as well just read them, and I'll talk about the stuff that I that I can uh, add uh, about. One of them is about CSS3 enhancements. One of them is about styling lists. And one of them is about testing and debugging pages. Now, we've kind of done that throughout the term, and I do that individually in lab. Um, we, I will talk a little bit about that chapter uh, today. Um, the one thing I do want to talk about that I don't think is adequately covered um, in, in, the, uh, in the book is talking about uh, accessibility for websites. In other words, what we...
validator. What it buys you is this. It doesn't guarantee that your page is going to look perfectly in all browsers, unfortunately. All right? But it's a good first step in ensuring that. All right? Because you follow the rules. Any problem, therefore, is a problem with the browser that's being viewed in. Now, that's both good news and bad news. All right? It's good news because, well, hey, yeah, you did it right. Chances are any future browsers that come out will also be able to display your code correctly, you know, with the assumption that they're continuing to improve and get rid of problems in browsers and all that. So that's the good news. That's your best bet in ensuring what they call forward compatibility. In other words, that your page works on future browsers. The bad news is, is if it doesn't work in a particular browser, guess whose problem it is to fix it? It's yours, right? Um, that's just, you know, that's just the, the, the way it works. You know, if, for example, your web page doesn't work in IE8, all right, maybe they fix that problem in IE9, but guess what? There's still a lot of people in the world using IE8. And even if you were to convince Microsoft to change IE8, which isn't going to happen, but even if you did, getting that out to all the people in the world running IE8 is going to be a problem. So, Therefore, just because it validates, that's a good first step, but it shouldn't be the last step. You should test your pages across the browsers and configurations that you think are likely for your customers to have. That really is probably the toughest thing about web design, is the fact that you can do everything by the book and follow all the rules and still have a problem, all right? Because the folks that made the browser messed something up, all right? But you know, you, you got to, you got to, you know, play with the cards you've been dealt. So that's part of web development and, and you just, you just have to deal with it. Yes? Along those lines, like, we would get, hmm? is it HTML5 that we're probably going it, it depends on the organization. Um, you know, r you know, right now, you know, yeah, think about it. You know, if you're an organization that has a website that's working, um, and let's say you want to make a, a, a change to it, um, you might not necessarily take the time to rewrite it in HTML5. So you might continue to use the specification you have been using. That being said, if you were going to make a massive redesign that required a lot of rework, you'd likely say, hmm, I probably want to do it in HTML5. Now, as there's greater browser support, and as time goes on, that will become more and more of a case. That being said, that's always an issue. You know, it's not like, as of this day, everyone's doing HTML5 development. There, there's a lot of legacy stuff out there that works, and it doesn't make sense strategically for an organization to completely rework something um, you know, if what they have essentially works, they just need small changes. That being said, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? I mean, you could, for example, on a, on a site that was done in HTML4 or XHTML1, if you were introducing a new section of that site, you could code it in HTML5 and start taking advantage of some of the features of, of HTML5 sort of to make the transition easier. So, there's no easy pat answer as far as that goes. If you're talking about a brand new project, it's probably still not 100%, but it would be a much better chance that, that you'd want to tackle it in HTML5. An existing project, all bets are off, you know, whatever they want. Other questions? All right. So when I say validate your page, that's what I mean. Run your code through the validator and make sure it validates per HTML5. Now, our next topic that we'll spend the rest of today and we'll spend next time on is about website accessibility. All right. Now, I'm going to give you a couple spoilers here. 
All right, so, you know, we'll jump to the conclusions first, and then we'll go back and we'll, we'll develop those conclusions. All right. Here's some of the conclusions that we're going to come to. Accessibility equals basic good design plus some specific accommodations. All right. And this is kind of good news, right? It, it would it would kind of kind of not be very good if I were to say, okay, now we're talking about accessibility. Let's throw everything out the window that we've learned about design and let's, uh, let's, let's, let's figure out a new way of designing pages. No. A lot of things I'm going to say when we talk about this from an accessibility perspective are things I've been saying all along. For example, keep it simple. All right? That makes sense, right, in a web design. Make the navigation easy and all that. That also has an uh, accessibility aspect to it, though. There's reasons why making your web pages simple is good from an accessibility standpoint as well. Now that being said, unfortunately it isn't just these basic web design principles. There are some special things that we do specifically for people with disabilities. All right. Now here's the interesting thing. Some of those special things will benefit everyone And some of them are not even noticeable, unless you're looking for them, for the most part. For example, how many of you have noticed that outside the door, on the door, in addition to the number being displayed, there is the number of the room in Braille? All right. You may have noticed that, you may not have. Right? Now that's something that doesn't benefit people that aren't blind, but it also doesn't bother people that aren't blind. It doesn't get in the way. It's unobtrusive. It's easy to ignore, if you will. It doesn't hurt anything, in other, in other words. Now, let's think of something that is there for accessibility, but actually might benefit you. Can anyone think of, let's forget about websites, and let's think of the real world, a physical building here, here at the college. Can you think of anything that may have been done for reasons of accessibility, yet benefits people even if they don't have disabilities? Yes. A ramp. Right. And when would that benefit someone? Yeah, exactly. A lot of people have those roll-link briefcases or, or, or bags or whatever you want to call them. And a ramp. They may have put that ramp in there as a wheelchair ramp, but guess what? A student that's pulling one of those uh, bags on wheels behind them is going to find that very useful as well. All right? So, there's some things that we can say we're doing it in the name of accessibility, but we'll find out that it's also going to benefit everyone else. All right? Um, at the very least, it shouldn't be getting in anyone's way. You know? Think of the ramp out there. Even if I'm not pushing it in, I have my shoulder bag, all right? It doesn't bother me to go up a ramp instead of stairs. You know, it's not really that much of a difference for me one way or another. All right. So we're going to make this observation, and we're just going to keep coming back to this over and over and over again, that accessibility is a reinforcement of these basic good design techniques along with some special accommodations. Now, some of those accommodations are going to benefit everyone, or at least potentially benefit everyone, or potentially benefit people beyond people with disabilities. And most of them will be not even noticeable if, if they don't benefit. What are some of the disabilities that will impact someone accessing and using a website. Yes. 
Yeah, limited vision. So either blind or limited vision or I guess limited, another way to say it is bad vision or even something like color blindness. Those are all things that could affect someone accessing a website. Now this brings up a good point, right? Because sometimes people say, well, you know, accessibility involves, you know, allowing blind people to be able to access your website. That's a part of it, no doubt, right? Because people that are blind should be able to access your website and get the information from it. And we'll talk more specifically how that's done in a bit. But if you talk about a disability, blindness, all right, there's all sorts of lesser versions of that disability that are relevant as well. In other words, I'm not blind, yet I don't have particularly good eyesight. All right? So therefore, yeah, okay, I'm not blind, but some of the things that you might do for someone that's blind might actually help me out. Person that's colorblind isn't blind, yet they have issues with their vision and distinguishing between different colors. All right? So people tend to think in terms of extreme and say, well, you know, accessibility will make it for blind people, you know, and we'll, and we'll do things that will help blind people, you know. But there's sort of milder forms of that disability that are also very relevant and that need assistance as well. This also points out the importance of accessibility as a concept. You know, you hear some people that are cynical that say things like, you know, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of money on a site that's only going to help a small percentage of the people that are blind. Well, I would disagree with that attitude, first of all. I would disagree with that attitude on a couple of counts. First of all, if it's, if it's designed from the start, it doesn't cost all that much more extra to do that. Secondly, I would say, if I have some content, I want the world to be able to see and access my content, not just people uh, that can see. And then lastly, when you start factoring in sort of the mild forms of this disability, you'll notice that it's a much, much broader base of people. What are other sort of disabilities that could impact a person's ability to access the web? Besides vision related. Okay. Um, we'll call that... Um, Motor impairment. All right. One one example of that is someone that 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 you know is uh, 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 you know this paralyzed. All right. What are some other that, that's sort of the extreme case of it. What are some other milder forms of that? Go ahead. certain neurological things that, that make sort of fine pointing difficult w with that. You know, they can move their arms, but to go and very finely point on something on the screen and click on it uh, can be uh, tough. All right? Again, certain neurological uh, impairments would do that. Also would, would have sort of the same sort of thing, people with arthritis, people with carpal tunnel. All right? All those things might allow or might make difficult to point and click on something um, very small, very tiny on the screen. Now, the one thing that I will add to this discussion is, unfortunately, as folks get older, age-related conditions, sort of encompass almost all of these disabilities that we're going to talk about. In other words, people as they get older, they don't necessarily become blind, but typically their vision isn't as good as it once was. People don't necessarily lose the motor skills, 
but the ability to fine point on something small on the screen because of arthritis or shakiness in the hand or whatever might become more difficult. All right. What's another disability that's relevant here as far as accessing content on the web? So those are two good ones. Yeah, I, w I, would, I would put an amputee in, in with, with motor skills as well. Well, you tell me. Would deafness relate to accessing content on the web? Yeah. It, yeah, in some situations, yes. All right. Okay, and, and, and this is a good jumping off point to discuss um, how certain things you can do for deaf people can help everyone under certain circumstances. For example, and we'll, we'll touch on this and we'll continue on this on, on Wednesday. For example, one thing I absolutely hate on CNN site is sometimes their news stories are only video. All right? Why do you suppose I don't like that? Well, if I'm, if I'm in a lab, for example, with students and I'm sitting up there waiting for students to ask me questions and I'm checking out the news, you know, I may not have headphones with me, or I might not want to put headphones on in lab, and therefore I can't hear that web st that that story uh, on there, right? Because if I press play, there's no speakers in the computer in the lab. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to get an idea of what it is. That's one case in, uh, of that in a public computing environment. If everyone had their speakers playing something else, it would be chaos. So usually they turn off the speakers on those computers. All right. Second thing is, is I can read pretty quick, all right? So there might be a three-minute news report that I could scan the text in 30 seconds and see if it's something that I'm interested in, and, and maybe then I'll listen to the story, all right? Now, people that are deaf, you know, they have a much bigger problem with that. They don't have any other recourse. If it's only audio content, they can't get that content, all right? So what could they do in that case? Well, they could have a transcript along with the video. So if someone wants to watch the video, they get that. Someone wants to scan through it, someone's in a lab, or someone's deaf, they can read through it. Again, a case of those special accommodations, in other words, putting a transcript of an audio or video clip, could actually, under some circumstances, benefit everyone, right? They can benefit me when I'm in lab and I want to see a news story or, 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 or get the information from a news story. Or when I'm in a hurry and don't feel like sitting through a four-minute video and I just want to scan through it, all right? Between now and Wednesday, think of other conditions because, again, we've covered a lot of the big ones, but there's still more conditions that affect a person's ability to access information on, on the web. And after we do that, our goal will be to start coming up with some of these ideas of how we can help those people and possibly in the meantime help everyone else that doesn't have those disabilities or at the very least don't do anything to make it harder for people that don't have disabilities. Don't put anything extra in their way. All right. We'll pick up on that on Wednesday.